Uh, hi there. My name is Claire Allman. I'm an associate director here of marketing here at Empower. And I've been here actually a little over six years. And something that's really impressed me about this company my entire time here has been just a really passionate group of former international students seeking to make the journeys for future international students much smoother, better, uh, so you can achieve your dreams. And so here with me today, I have two former international students currently living their dreams here in the U.S., uh, both Arbaz and Yudi. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment. But first, I'm going to launch a poll so we can learn a little bit more about you. And then I'll turn it over to them for an introduction. One moment. So you should have just received a poll. You'll have a few minutes to answer that, why these two introduce themselves. And so Arbaz, I'm going to start with you. Do you mind introducing yourself for everyone here? Sure thing. Not at all, actually. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Arbaz Hashmi. I belong to a small city in India called Lucknow. Uh, I graduated this May from, it's, it's taking a bit of a time to get used to the fact that I graduated. For the last two years, I've been saying, currently, I am pursuing my MBA program. So I've just graduated this May from the MBA program at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, loved it. Uh, although at one point it didn't look like it, but I would be able to go for it, considering that it was right in the middle of COVID season and visa was a big issue at that time. Uh, prior to my MBA, I, said, I spent about 10 years working in the strategic thematic partnerships and business development space across different industries, and which included Empower and the higher education uh, space as well. Uh, I worked specifically in the financing part of this journey. So I might have a slightly unique lens of looking at this entire process from the borrower side, from the student side, and as well as from the lender side or an institutional side as well. Happy to share any tips uh, or experience, uh, anything, uh, my mistakes that you want to get to know on. Feel free to ask any questions on that. Thank you, Arbaz. Cool. Yudi, same question. No surprises. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Thank you for having me here. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yudi, and uh, I came to you. I am from Mumbai, India, and uh, came to United States in 2013 uh, to do my master's in computer science. So it's been almost 10 years uh, since I've been in United States. Uh, I, at, after my first semester, I realized that I don't want to do coding uh, or software engineer. So I switched my career trajectory to more program and product management. So uh, I have experience as a project management, uh, engineering manager, and uh, team lead and scrum master. And right now, I am currently uh, professionally senior product manager for a fintech startup in Chicago. We do um, we don't do education loans; we do car loans. <laughs> uh, but uh, on a as a hobby, I make content uh, because I realize there's a lot of gaps and myths and uh, misconception uh, which people have about United States and life, uh, especially international students in United States. So I decided to share and inspire through my journey. And um, so I talk, I, I make content for international students about how to study abroad here and how to break into tech industry um, on my YouTube and Instagram and all the other places. But yeah, that's me. Thank you so much. And so this means you have another five to 10 seconds to answer this poll until we get to the end of my really long sentence. Uh, it looks like there's still about 50 of you that need to tell us just a little bit more about you. And I'm going to close it now. So ending the poll and sharing with all of you. Great. So most people here are from Africa. Great to have you at 87%. And then uh, South and Southeast Asia at 7% and some representation from East Asia as well. But uh, great to see everyone. Conveniently, Empower serves all of you. So you're in the right, right spot. In terms of career direction, Ooh, this is a little bit different than normal, which I like. It looks like today we have 54% in other. I have, I don't know what other is. That's really, really interesting. Uh, we'll have to learn more. And then we also have 18% in communication information systems, 13% uh, in health science technology, and then about equal representation, human services and agriculture. Uh, fantastic. And once again, Empower can help all of you. So uh, great to have all of you here. 
And what do you want to learn about today? This is kind of an equal split between the study abroad experience at 47%. 36% are more interested in how to compare student loan options. And then 79% are for Empower Loan product details. I can only presume that you're allowed to select uh, as many things as you wanted, because that does not equal 100. Um, and then last, have you referred a friend to Empower? 27% with an all caps, yes. 34%, uh, I will do it soon. And then 38%, we will convince you today. Uh, by telling you more about Empower. So great to have everyone here. And so today's live session is focused on an introduction to Empower. And it's really meant for people that don't know much about us yet or know a little bit and want to learn more. So if that sounds like you, like you you're definitely in the right spot today. And uh, so we'll probably spend about 15 minutes with an introduction about UDs and ARBA as a study abroad experience. Uh, you know, you can learn more about what they went through. Then we'll switch to the financing journey and their advice about how to support yourself during school to get to the your uh, end dream. And then last, we'll have a Q&A segment in the last 15 minutes or so where we'll take the most common audience questions and address them here live. I can see that many people joined a little late. Uh, so just to give you a lay of the land, at the bottom of your screen, you will see something that says Q&A. And that's where you can leave us questions at any point during this live session. We have a lot of Empower staff available to answer those questions, and we'll also choose to answer some of them live. So if you're trying to uh, interact with us, the Q&A field is the best way to do so. Excellent. So jumping right in uh, to sort of the study, the pre-financing journey. Um, so maybe I'll start with Arbaz for this one. I'll try to alternate between both of you, but Arbaz. Why did you decide to study abroad? Okay, uh, for me, I think that was a uh, like a very how do I say? I have, I have learned and I've seen a lot of students that I helped go to US and different countries and had their study abroad journey. They all were happy about it. They all definitely, I mean, had mixed mixed experiences, but none of them regretted this journey. None of them regretted have, having to take an education from a different country, uh, no matter the cost and everything. And I thought that's a worthy investment. I should look into it too. Uh, and that's exactly what made me, I mean, I want to, I was looking for a growth in my career and, uh, and study abroad journey felt like a very good way of accelerating that growth and not spending the next 10 years uh, into getting to where I wanted to instead, maybe spend the five to six years only, which actually is something that a study abroad education could, I could get me. So that was my reason. Uh, simple as so simple as that growth and enough evidence that this works so yudi why did why did you decide to study abroad um yeah to be very honest i did not uh, one of my best friends i've shared this uh, a lot before in my uh, youtube videos as well one of my best friend was going uh, to usa and usc and he's like you should go to this this place is for you and i'm from like lower middle class family uh, there's no way I could even dream of uh, going. I always wanted to, like I, I dreamed of going to United States, but I, I know that it's impossible. So uh, from financial perspective, so, but luckily somehow I was able to uh, manage to manage it. The main reason, so that was one reason that my friend pushed me, but the other main reason was, uh, I guess, financial uh, dreams, which I had and the American dream I wanted to live. So uh, I've always heard of it and uh, engineers in India don't make enough money, uh, I guess. Uh, at least that was the case uh, 10 years ago. I don't know how much they make right now. Uh, but we, I realized that uh, it's there's a lot of uh, scope and the value we get over here in United States was way more. So it's like, all right, like this is something I would want to experience uh, and have that financial dream, which I had, uh, American dream I wanted to live and experience that what everyone talks about it. So, and I can uh, say that I am living the American dream and I'm, I do not regret it. And I would highly recommend everyone else to try it at least once. Fantastic answer. So Yudi, just digging in a little bit, you uh, said a friend sort of persuaded you to come here. Did you do a lot of planning on your journey here or, or less so? Uh, I did do, I mean, once he did pursue me, then I started figuring out what my options are. Uh, then I was like, all right, I have to give my entrance exams. And then 
figure out which universities to go because my budget was really uh, like I had a very strict budget that I cannot go about that. So so I had to figure out which universities will work in this. And then uh, obviously there was this big uh, debate like locations matter. And if you are not in a good location, you will not get a job. And if you're not in a high ranking universities, you'll not get a job which I don't think it's true. But um, so, yeah, so I did do a lot of planning around that and then made my decisions. And I was very particular about why I chose what universities, et cetera. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. But Arbaz, yes. how, how about you for your, for your planning? What did you what did you do before you really started your search? Well, I I was actually I, I knew my realities, which were that I had a full time job in which I had to maybe work at different time zones too at times. So I didn't really have a lot of time to prepare for a lot of these tests. What I was looking for was a good global brand that I could cash on uh, in, in, in the future and that everybody recognizes no matter where which country I actually go to uh, after my graduation or after my OPT ends. So Hopkins kind of fit in that that bill very perfectly. And I also knew that. Uh, from a lender's point of view, well, Hopkins is a university that is is good with uh, you know getting the lenders to approve the loans for the students as well. So from an ROI standpoint, a lender would only invest in a in an education if they see that there is a good ROI. It's it was clear and simple for me. I trusted the uh, the credit model of all the big lenders out there. I was like, okay, they are good to go with Johns Hopkins. I'm good to go with Johns Hopkins as well. Let's make sure that I know exactly why I'm getting into this. The education, the coursework and all of that definitely was something that I was looking for. It was too experiential, something that I wanted to have in my MBA program. Uh, but at the same time, it didn't really require a very high GMAT or a GRE score. That was my realities that I couldn't have prepared that well and, and invested that much time. So I was looking for in the mid range of 310 to 320 GRE score. And if if I could score that, would be an easy admit into that. That's exactly how it worked. Didn't really work too hard. I just worked the right way and it got into the school I wanted. And so it sounds like for both of you, you kind of did a sort of a self-assessment about where you are, the means you have, and then then looked into selecting your your school and kind of making plans that way. Beauty, is that about right on your process or to do anything anything different? Sorry, Claire, can you repeat that? Um, I lost uh, my AirPods. <laughs> that happens <laughs> to the best of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so when I, uh, you know, listening to both of you, it sounds like you did a self-assessment, you know, pretty far in mm -hmm. advance about where you are uh, in your career and what what budget you have, and then did your school search. Is that is that right, or did you do anything more specific or differently? Mm, yeah, that's yeah, that's very accurate. That's how I approached my journey, study abroad journey. Awesome. So Arbaz, I'm guessing same for you. Uh, so the, I, I see a smile <laughs> and I'm going to answer before he even has. Time yes. Me, no. <laughs> I mean, pretty, pretty, but I will still answer the question. Yes. Uh, the idea was always where I am and where I want to be in the next 10 years or so. And what kind of path would I like to take? As I mentioned in the, in the first part of the introduction, uh, there was always a normal path that I could have taken, which is what I thought was 10 to 12 years of where I wanted to be. And uh, then this was, uh, there was another path, which in in blew out a bit of an investment, but uh, money-wise but at the, and time-wise too. But at the same time, that could accelerate my growth to get me where I want to be in maybe six, seven years rather than 10 years, what I've spent. And, and I think that's, that is very important to know where you are and where you want to be if you ever want to invest in an education, because an education will always be a stepping stone onto that, that, that dream, that life that you want to, right? It cannot be a goal itself. Yeah. So for, no, for both of you, what parts did you find easier in planning your journey and what uh, parts were more frustrating? Uh, I'll start with Yudi. Um, I mean, for me, it was uh, figuring out the finances was the hardest part uh, in my study abroad journey, because again, like I, I didn't know like how, how I'll get the funds and how much it's going to cost. Plus, like some lenders only support uh, tuition fees. So then I have to figure out like, all right, my cost of living and all the other expenses. Um, so th so that was like the hardest part for me. Uh, easiest part was I knew uh, like what I like, I knew what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go, like Arbas mentioned. So that was the easiest part to figure out like 
once I have my scores ready, I know these are the universities I'm going to go to. And I had a very reasons very clear why each universities I'm choosing uh, as my shortlist. And so those that was like easy part. But the hardest part was for me was the finances. Arbaz, what about what about you? So financing was not the difficult part for me. It was the easiest part. <laughs> because I had here, enough experience in the <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It was something that I, I knew exactly what I wanted to get. As I mean, unfortunately, couldn't get an Empower loan because at that time Empower only lent fifty thousand dollars and I needed a bit more. But even with that, I, I had a plan what to do and where to approach, and I got the loan for that. But for me, visa was the most difficult part, actually. As I mentioned uh, earlier as well, it, because there were no visa slots, even if you have the funding or not have the funding, mm. uh, there's nothing, very little that you can do because the, the earliest slot that I could have gotten was uh, February 28th of the next year. So that was the reality at that time. And, and if they hadn't really opened up new slots, I don't think I would have been able to get there. But the the part that was uh, even made it, like that made it worse was that I got COVID somewhere in April. And that was right in the middle of my, even though I had a financing thing sorted out, that was right in the middle of my financing journey. And I was taking a collateralized loan. So that kind of, because for a collateralized loan, you need to get your collateral inspected and all of those things. And nobody could uh, come in because I had COVID. So that kind of delayed the process for so long for me, uh, even though I knew what I had to be done, but it still delayed it by a month. So there are going to be a lot of unforeseen circumstances, surprises, shocks, even if you have worked in the in an industry and you know your way at the back of your hand, it, it's still going to do, surprise you, this journey. So be prepared. That's going to yeah. be yeah. advice on that. Yeah. So my, my last question sort of in this intro about the study abroad journey uh, for both of you. And so starting with you, Yudi, what is one thing that you would do differently if you did it all over again? Probably get loan from Empower. Yeah. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> uh, but um, I think uh, I would spend a little bit more time on my uh, career clarity. So I came to do my master's in computer science. And then when I came here, I realized that, oh, I really want to do product or program management. And uh, having that clarity was helpful. Like, it would have been helpful. So then I would have approached my uh, like choosing of courses and major and uh, universities would have been a little different than what I did. Uh, so I would like, yeah, that's one part I would change is to figure out uh, really doing introspection and not just follow like computer science is the way to go. And everyone should just do that because everyone does that versus really figure out who you are and what you really want to do, what your true skill, skill set, skills are and purposes. Uh, that's what I would like change about my study abroad journey other than getting a loan from Empower. <laughs> Great answer, both parts. Um, Arba, same <laughs> question. <laughs> I think uh, for me, and I think I, I know that we have discussed this when I originally went for an MBA, I think I reached out to you saying that it's hard for me to make friends being an introvert that I am, it, it was, I was really struggling to uh, meet people, or at least it was just my own fear that I was not approaching, reaching out. And, and I know that you have two years with these people, but if you look at for like a time you have per person, it's going to be very less concerning so how many things you have to do in the, in the two years that you have with the program. I, I should have maybe if, if I had to do something differently, I would have started reaching out to people, making friends with them, being friends with them a little too, little earlier in the program, other than spend six months sulking in the corner and then <laughs> win the next semester, <laughs> you know, actually making an attempt to, to, to be friends with people. Uh, that would have been my go-to plan if I had to do this differently. Great answer. Is a great answer from both of you. So just to summarize what I heard these guys say today, one is, plan as early as possible. It makes it so you're not rushing. There's going to be unforeseen happenings. So, you know, having a good, strong plan can be the foundation of your study abroad journey. And I think the other one I heard was clarity, having clarity around where you're going, what you want to do, and not necessarily find the crowd, but in your visa interviews, in your graduate school interviews, they're going to ask what you want to do. And the more certain you are that you're foreseeing that, the easier it'll be to make decisions along the way and also get there. So those are two things I heard outside of getting them power alone, which both of you uh, should have, <laughs> but here we are. Uh, 
So moving on to the financing journey. Um, so we've, we've definitely gone through the study abroad journey, but now this is really, you know, typically outside of Arbaz's visa uh, comment, this is typically where we hear students have the most questions and probably the most, uh, you know, struggle in figuring out how to, how to approach this. And so starting with you, Arbaz, you, you've worked in the financing industry for a really long time. Why do you think it's necessary, both from your personal perspective as well as how you used to advise students? Okay. Uh, I think, I mean, if, if you do not have a 100% scholarship from your school, the, the truth is that it's going to be expensive. And uh, if, if you do not live in an in economy where the currency difference isn't too much, it's, it's, you wouldn't have that many savings to you know, supplement for your education. It's, it's a reality and something that is happening that it is it's expensive, right? Financing, I mean, even if you have money to pay for your education from your own pocket, Think about it this way: that I, we just told, we just mentioned that there's going to be unforeseen circumstances, shocks, my, like you know, surprises for you. Now that could delay a lot of things for you. That could derail a lot of plans for you as well. You might have come thinking that yes, I'm gonna get a hundred fifty thousand dollar job or a two hundred thousand dollar job, and you might be good enough to do that. But at the same time, there are going to be economical factors, multiple things that you cannot avoid. And what if something happens where you have to? maybe struggle a little more and at the same time uh, what what you can what you can assume from that uh, that situation is that it's going to maybe take up some more of your money and that is where it gets tricky for you like that is where you don't want to be in a position where you can't take a risk where you can't uh, take a leap of faith for your career you are totally dependent on the money that you have and that is where financing helps because it's not technically your money like you're not paying it out of your own pocket, you owe it to someone and you'll pay it when you'll get a job. So that is where it really helps because if at all there, there's a situation that you can't really manage or handle and it's, an, it's a shocker for you, you can always use money that you have in your pocket if, if, if that goes over your student loan. But using your student loan, you're using a private savings, a personal savings right away. And it's like at the start of the program might not be the best idea, but I'm really because it would be hard for you to get a loan in the in the start in the later part of the education as well and you would have already used up your money now you could use your personal savings for both and i know i'm going a little too overboard with this but it's important to, for you to understand that you can use your personal savings for both uh, education as well as your own food but you can't use your student loan for your food back home as well so it it needs to be taken clear into account that why don't you use a money that is exactly used for education, that is designed in a way where you can use it well, pay it when you get a job too, and it's working. People take loans, people repay the loans as well. People do get the jobs enough to pay for them. And that is where I feel financing is a much better option because it doesn't really put any undue pressure on you or your family who where you have, might have borrowed the money. Uh, it's going to be very professional, something that you can always have clarity on how much you need to pay, how much you need to repay, and when can you repay. That is where, on the whole, I feel it's a much sorted option to go with, and you'll have a peace of mind. Sorry if that was too long. No, I think it was a great answer. And so now UD gets the fun job of summarizing what Arbaz just said. So UD, <laughs> do you mind <laughs> clarifying just three different types of, of financing options or funding options available that you may have explored in your in your earlier journey? Yeah, yeah. Um, the number one was personal funds. Like obviously people have savings and uh, whatever, like uh, any kind of personal family, friends uh, kind of thing. So that's like personal fund. Second one is an obvious one, which is like the education loan, which you can get out from different lenders. Uh, third one, which uh, is scholarships. Like if people get like 100% full, full ride scholarship, things like that. But that still includes maybe just tuition fees, you still have to pay like insurance and other things uh, uh, your cost of living. One of the mistakes I've seen people ha make in terms of financing, I, I know you didn't ask this, Claire, but I wanted to share is, uh, uh, is like people don't people don't plan, uh, they plan that they are assuming that they're going to get on campus jobs, uh, they're going to get like TARA or something. And then they don't plan for their cost of living. And uh, when they come here, and then they have they're so stressed and panicked and figuring out like, how am I going to make my cost of living? So I would uh, recommend people to not, uh, not plan for that. 
actually plan everything without assuming that you're going to get like an on campus job or something but those are the three options with a three options with some helpful tips arba is where you going to add yeah. on that <laughs> Well, I was just saying, uh, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. I think that's yes, yes. 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 And so, I uh, we do at Empower offer a variety of scholarships in addition to the uh, you know education loans. And so, I think we'll have a chat moderator drop that link in the chat. They're just el- there's four international students. No one else is eligible to apply. So, if that is of interest to you, please uh, feel free. You don't need to be an Empower customer. Uh, to apply for one of our scholarships. Uh, And our chat moderator also dropped an eligibility check. If you are already convinced to apply for an Empower loan, you can definitely get started with that first link that that he just shared. And so back to our programming, awesome. So Arba is, you know, typically uh, funding is the most complex thing students talk about, but in your case, it was the visa. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of your, the visa process and any tips you have for that uh, that part? You are muted. You are, yeah. You are yep. muted. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So sorry about that. On uh, Arba's, one, let me uh, yeah. clarify real quick. It's not, not just visa tips, but can you talk through about where the visa uh, plays into the loan process and the correct order of operations? Yep. Thank you. Yes. So. I did mention that I got COVID, right? And that because of that, I, I was only, my funding process got delayed and then the visa process. And the, the, the sad part, the sad part or the happy part, whatever that could be, that if I, had be, if I had sorted my funding before April, I could have gotten a visa like much earlier because at that, that time the visa slots were available and after May, they were, they were none. So the, I, I mean, and in my experience, what I've seen students do is that they assume, and something that just uh, I'm piggybacking on the on the uh, point that Yuri did, that they ho- actually be a little delusional at times in terms of planning and hoping, and too optimistic about things, which could simply be that they choose a school or university, and they assume and they hope that uh, I'll get a funding for this very easily, without actually having to check. It's it's now that's the tricky part that they they get into this, and that is when the mess starts when you now they have like invested that much effort into their admissions. Now, because of that, they already have a sunk cost fallacy, which is I've already put in so much effort. I can't really back out. This is the school for me. I need to figure out funding options for this without realizing that if that school can get uh, enough funding from a lender or not, if if, if a lending option is in their plan or not. But at the same time, what if you were hoping for that scholarship and you didn't get that scholarship and the admit came in? And you're like, well, I now have to look for a loan without thinking, realizing, without knowing that if you will actually get a loan for that school or not. It's very important to not think of these processes as separate. I mean, visa is the only thing that you can only do once you have the funding and the I-20. But everything else, try to do it parallelly. Try to not to think of it as a sequential process where uh, one month I'll finish this then I'll get into this. Like, it's not going to happen about once I'll finish the test prep, that's when I'll be applying. No, you need to figure out how much test score can I do I need to get to get into the school. So for that, you need to figure out your school first. And for the school, you need to figure out, can you get a funding for this or not? Fortunately, Empower has a prequal tool that you can actually use. And it was a very nice segue to this, right? But it's, it's something that is brilliant and actually used for students uh, and like made for students who are in that process of figuring out what are my options or where do I go from here? What we talked about, the clarity in the first the start of the session, you need to have clarity where you want to go. And is this the stepping stone for me? Can I actually get this? This is something that uh, this, is, this is something that exactly what you that the pre-quartal can get you while you're thinking about your options. Why don't you check? Well, I have eight options. How much funding can I get for them? And then work backwards on it. Your, fund, your funding options are sorted. So you know which schools are the ones that you can actually get your funding with your profile and then figure out how, what test score do I need to get for each of those schools, prepare for those test scores and get that done. But think of this process as something that you need to do everything all at once. And it, that's what makes it a little messy. But at the same time, that's what good planning is all about. Arbaz, what I'm hearing from you is don't just do one thing, get over it, and then look into the next thing. It's that you should plan your entire journey from test scores through your future career to the best of your ability. Is yeah. that, yep, yeah, awesome. Exactly. So, Everything check. except visa can be prepared while you're figuring out your study abroad journey. 
Amazing. And so I, Yudi, just to expand upon what Arba has shared, when you get into, you know, deciding how to fund uh, your education, you have a lot of experience in sort of, you know, creating content and helping others, you know, choose between lenders. From your perspective, what's the best way to go about that process? Um, yeah, I think finding some, like a trusted lender is like super important. Uh because I've heard stories where, especially it has happened with me as well, where I am not taking a like education loan. I've gotten like personal loans from friends and family. And like, there has been times where I have to pay fees and I'm like still struggling to get this person to send the money to me. And so having someone you can trust as a lender is super important uh, in, in like terms of uh, uh, whether when you need the money, you are going to have it, especially uh, when it comes to registering your classes and things like that. I've heard the same story in terms of disbursement with some of the lenders where uh, they have approved the loan, but the whole disbursement process takes forever and there's a lot of paperwork involved and it's it's just, uh, it's not uh, on time. And then you have to figure out another uh, income, like some form of another source to get the money while the lender figures out their uh, processes. Uh, so having uh, a lender where you can trust and have them ha have them help you in their entire your journey is something I would like look for in terms of finding a good lender. Arba, since this used to be your job as well, anything to add on how to choose a lender? <laughs> I mean, uh, in addition to what Yudi has said, def definitely, and, and yes, uh, there have been instances where not the whole money has been disbursed because the, the lender did not, does not have the money. They committed to a certain amount, but they ran out of funds. But I also, I think that we undervalue the importance of a lender being invested in your career and your success. I mean, they have given you the money to be successful. It just makes it a little obvious and logical that they should be invested in your success as well in some way. And that is something that I've not seen from any of the lenders out there, a lot of lenders. Uh, so, and, and I got, when I first heard about Empowered, which was six, seven years back, that's when I realized what well, a lender could be this too, where they are going to actually help the borrowers with their career, make sure that they are ready for the job search in the new country, make sure they have all the right tools, uh, the right resources, uh, the right knowledge, understanding exactly who do I need to connect to, uh, to actually get this job. And that support is so important. And you only realize when you come here and start looking for jobs. Oh, I have, I'm not prepared for this job search at all. And that is where if you have a very good career development office in your university, good, they'll help you maybe. But if you don't, you would be very feel you would feel very helpless at times. And you would actually resort to a lot of misinformation as well. And that is where the right information at the right time is so important to be given for students. Because once the time lapses, different sectors have different timelines for internship searches. Once you miss that, that deadline, that timeline, you don't really have a chance to get an internship in that sector anymore, unless and until they may be recruiting for a late recruitment or so. And that is where you need to take up your mind of think of it as a whole, not just the money part, but what after that? Can, can, can they help me in being successful in the US in some way or in Canada in some way? I think these are some questions that we need to ask. What can your lender do for you? Not the other way. <laughs> Um, I like that quote, actually. Uh, I'm going to start quoting you, Arbaz. What can your lender do for you? Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, that's a really great benefit Empower has. We have our Path to Success program, which helps all of our customers in their career journey after they graduate uh, to make sure, you know, when you're successful, clearly we're successful too. But uh, back to the cold, hard numbers, which is how many people evaluate their uh, loan options. I know all of us working in finance are aware of the differences between a variable rate loan and a fixed rate loan. And that's actually something that makes Empower a bit unique in that we offer a fixed rate product compared to some of the other options. But uh, rather than me explain it, uh, Arbaz, can you talk a little bit about the differences between a fixed and variable rate loan? And then I'll let Yudi talk about why that matters. Sure thing. Uh, I mean, a fixed rate would always be the same way, no matter. So the way, okay, let me put it this way. Any lender who has, you know, accumulated funds to, or maybe borrowed funds from a certain entity to, dis to disburse or to distribute it to students would have raised the funds on a certain cost. 
and that cost could be depending on the economical factors, the market factors, whatnot. And then they lend it to you at a certain higher rate because they need to get some profit at Zen, at Zen as well. Now, when the situations change, the cost of capital changes, that risk, that change is for a, in a variable interest rate gets directly transferred to the borrower. That risk, that change in the interest rate gets not absorbed by the lender. And if, the, if their cost of capital increases, your interest rate increases correspondingly. Whereas in a fixed rate of interest, any lender which offers that would give you that guarantee that no matter what the market conditions are, no matter what our cost of capital is, your rate will remain the same thing, no matter how much of at what rate are we raising it or whatnot. And that is so important to budget your payments. You have a peace of mind and you know exactly from here on until the next 10 years, how much do I have to pay every month? And that helps you plan your career, your finances so well. You have, no, I mean, I do not have a fixed rate of interest right now. I have a variable rate of interest and it's killing me because <laughs> I want to repay, I want to repay me, repay my loan as soon as possible. I, on the off chance that it gets increased, I was I worked as a, in a different lender for a while, and I had to make those calls to the borrowers where you have to tell them the rate rate has increased. Uh, or didn't you see the blueprint? It said in the contract it can. Those are very tough questions, but they're tough conversations. But it happens, and I would not want to be in the receiving end of this. Would love to be able to budget my loan properly, be have the peace of mind, and know exactly what I want to pay and how much do I want to pay. So Arbad, I'm going to take you half a step back just in case some of our audience is uh, unfamiliar cool. with uh, fixed and variable rates. A fixed rate loan means your monthly payment will not change once you've signed the loan offer. The fixed rate loan is just the same payment because your rate, once you sign, will never change. So when Arbad says yeah. fixed rate and empowers a fixed rate, that is what we're talking about. The variable rate means that when market conditions change and the cost of capital changes for everyone around the world, that risk is put to you because your rate is also changing. So that means for those loan offers that when the market rates go up, your rate goes up. When it goes down, goes your goes down. Uh, right now, we are in a rising interest rate environment. So you should expect, and as we all have expected, those rates are going to keep climbing. Uh, and so... I you know for anyone that didn't under doesn't isn't familiar with variable versus fixed rate, that's what we're we're speaking to. Um, and so Yudi, Arbaz gave us a great example about you know how a variable rate is killing him at this moment. He looks alive, but uh, sorry about that, dude. Um, <laughs> but uh, can you tell us more about how you know how you think about it? Yeah, I talk to a lot of my audience, and they they've gotten the similar uh, situation like Arbaz where they got the variable rate and it's uh, at the time the way it's been pitched to them that oh it's variable it's never going to go up but they when they got it it was like you know 10% and it's now 13% 14% 15% or so on whatever that number is um and they it's it's hard for them to make that payment back because like they are paying the principal but then are also paying this increasing rate of interest uh, and that creates so much stress on them to to like have a job and like it's just like a lot more than what they are already have to figure out on finding an internship and job and all of that so i empathize with urbaza uh, situation because i also know it has happened with a lot of my audience and i know they've shared the same pain points so having something which is a fixed rate where i knew that all right i took it this time and it's going to be so and so percentage forever until i pay off which is super nice because i don't have to worry about rate market situation the macroeconomic like all right if the market is falling or something like you mentioned claire so um so yeah and it also helps in terms of planning your uh, entire budget that all right this is my budget this is what i'm going to get the loan then i can figure filter it down to this is what my program selection will be because this is what I'm going to get. Uh, so I can plan everything based on that fixed interest rate versus that having that variable where it could go up. And then later on, after you've completed your master's, you are like struggling to pay back. So, yeah. So that's one key way to evaluate lenders is, you know, what type of interest rate do they have? Is it fixed? Is it variable? But another key difference that we see in education loan is whether it's secured on something, typically a cosigner or, you know, in Arbaz's case, collateral, which he mentioned earlier. 
And so uh, starting with, uh, I think, Arbaz, you know, you made this decision, uh, you know, in the recently about whether to go with a cosine loan, a collateralized loan, and, uh, you know, Empower actually doesn't do either. So can you talk a bit more about that feature? Sure. Uh, actually, so uh, my, my loan has both, actually, a cosigner as well as a collateral, I'm, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, I got the premium package. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a co-signer is, is typically someone who applies for the loan with you uh, and is liable to repay the loan if the borrower doesn't. So they have full legal responsibility of uh, this loan ac alongside you. And one of the assessments that's done for them while, while they have, a, they have uh, during the assessment of the application is their financial standing is going to be checked. Their credit, their credit history is going to be checked as well. And the financial standing has to be good enough so that if you don't repay, they can repay the loan on your behalf. So typically you should understand that this would mean a person who uh, in your family and is, tech and is normally considered someone in the family who is an, as close of the relation, the better it is. So if you have someone who is your parent who's going to co-sign a loan for you, that is generally very acceptable. If you have a very distant relative, might raise some eyebrows, why would he help you? And uh, in, in this loan, like, what's the motivation here? It just not can't be just because they love you so much, but it's definitely raised some eyebrows. And there are further clarification that, that are done in this uh, for a co-signer loan. It's it's not always easy for international students to find someone who, uh, you know, who is who earns that much and it has a good credit report as well in, in most of the equations. And then there's a whole idea of collateral. Let's say a cosigner is not enough. You need a loan that requires further security. You need a higher amount. And, and that's exactly what happened with me, that I needed a loan amount, which was enough to, like for all the worst case scenarios, as, as Yudi mentioned that I went exactly like that. I was like, let's assume that I would get not, a, I would not get a job. I would be unemployed the entire two years. How much money would I need? And that's exactly the loan amount that I got approved. But but because of that, I had to put up a collateral, a property, and uh, that involves further uh, examination, assessment of the property in itself, where they would send someone at your, at your property to assess it. You have to send the contracts of the property exactly how it's done. They would check it out. It's, it's a whole nightmare. Nobody, I mean, I would not wish that experience on anyone because the, just to go through with it, it's, it's not ideal, uh, you know, and then it also involves that you have put up your own properties, your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that that you that you that that you would own in terms of like a house. It's you know where you want to live for a collateral, and then the mind games begin. What if I'm not able to repay the loan? What if this goes on? And that is that kind of inhibits your ability to take to take any risk. Uh, for your career, for yourself, learn when that could give you so many rewards. But on the off chance, what if things go wrong? What if I'm not able to uh, repay the loan on time and my property and the co-signer who is involved is going to get that done? And that is where a lot of these options are not very student focused. They are rather co-signer or collateral focused, that they are assessing the collateral or the co-signer and then giving the loan. They're not assessing the borrower at all or rather very, 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 in a very small level. That's it. But uh, Empower actually offers for an Empower loan, if, if at all you need some extra funds, you can actually offer a sponsor. And that is, I'm going to label it as a sponsor, not as a co-signer. That person can help you with your education with whatever money, gift, or if it's a additional loan that you are get, taking from them, but they don't have any legal responsibility to repay. In Empower loan, only the borrower is liable to repay the loan at all times. So feel free to use a sponsor if at all there is a need for it. But that's a good thing because you can have a peace of mind that your parents or family members would not be involved legally in the loan process. And it's you who's going to be assessed and who's going to be liable to repay the loan. And that's actually what we hear a lot from our, our customers uh, is that there's a lot more uh you know, it reduces stress. It feels better to know everything's dependent on you and your parents' house and your family isn't affected by how you want to, you know, live and pursue your uh, pursue your career. And so that's actually a key reason we actually hear people are happy uh, with Empower's uh, option. But uh, Yudi, in working with your audience, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, I mean, um, I like uh, the flexibility. And plus, I like that it's on me. Uh, I I am taking that action. So I feel 
empowered as well that uh, like the name suggests empower <laughs> uh, i feel empowered that i it's me who, who's making that decision and i get to decide uh, in indian culture at least uh, the way it works is like you your parents chooses you know a career for you they chooses your spouse for you and you want to fight back saying that no it's my life and i want to do this uh, similarly in terms of education if if i'm given the choice that i want to take that decision in my control and it should be on me uh, i think that gives you a like a little bit of relief that it's not my parents don't have to worry about it and i can this is on me and i'll like the whole thing i can take care of it and my parents don't have to stress it or, or anything so uh, so i i really like that option uh, in terms of it and that's what i've seen like a lot of my audience also are empower customer and they like the same uh, concept that they don't have to worry about collateral especially in my case i didn't even have collateral so i have to not worry about figuring out the other cultural part of it is where if you have to get a co-signer then you have to convince someone and again there's so much family drama and politics happening so you like i don't know if they are really want, willing to do it or not do it so uh, so having that uh, having that empower can let you do it on based on my uh, um skill set and what my career aspects are that's really helpful so 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 i really like about that yeah thank you for sharing that's a uh, fantastic to hear and so we are on our last question of this section before we move to our audience q and a so if you have a burning question audience and you haven't asked it now is definitely the time to make sure we can get back to you uh, but last question. So we've reviewed the interest rate differences. We've talked about secured loans versus unsecured loans. Last access I want to talk through a little bit is sort of a home country loan or a, a loan in your new country. So, for example, Empower is a U.S.-based company uh, versus Arbaz. I know you took a loan from a, an Indian lender. Can you talk a little bit more about how you would assess whether to go with a home country bank or uh, a bank in your new country? <clears throat> I would have preferred to go with a US based lender uh, primarily because I mean I know the the reasons why I would have I have recommended empower or uh, for a lot of the international students and and simply speaking there is always going to be a currency difference first of all uh, I needed for example I need $60,000 in tuition fees now that $60,000 can be anything a different amount in the indian indian rupee currency and by the time i got an get an approval and the time i get the disbursement that amount could change that amount might not be $60000 that amount would be a little less because the way the currencies are going right now and then there's a whole every time i would transfer the money and i would not i mean you either you take the whole disbursement in one go and get it transferred or you take this in different tranches which normally most of the people would do and for every time i get the money transferred from india to us i pay a certain amount on that as well that's not a very awesome thing and then there are uh, the processing fees that you have to pay uh, plus any taxes that you have to pay upfront costs that's so many upfront costs just to get the loan that i want and in my account like imagine the the processing fees to get these approval letter from there on to the 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 whole uh, remittance fee just to get it in my account and then by the time you are in my last semester for example for that has happened for me and thankfully i took an approval for a larger amount but the original amount that i had was uh, about a little close to $100,000 and now it's definitely lower than that by the time i have graduated it's the same amount is um, worth different um, like a different value in us dollars that is a tricky situation to be in i mean especially when you don't know when you're not earning and you need extra money and what if you actually got an approval of the just exact amount that is when you will be in a tricky spot what if that amount gets lower than the one that you need you'd have to put in your own funds just to supplement that amount and get it to back where it originally was and the and, and any my home country lenders might not be willing to increase the amount to cover up the cost as well they wouldn't uh, adjust for that currency the you know depreciation too that is where a us based lender might work well because you apply for $60000 they're going to approve a $60000 loan for you no matter what value is it in your home currency it's going to stay the same and i think from that standpoint 
it's an easier calculation to be done with zero upfront cost at like a loan like Empower. And there are so many, like up to two to 3% of up, upfront cost of the loan, no matter how much fund you use, you still have to pay the percentage upfront cost on the entire amount in terms of processing fees, whatever you have approved, not what you have used. That is a little unfair for international students. I mean, I definitely do not intend to use my entire amount, but I still had to pay my processing fees on the entire amount. So that is where it, it wasn't very economical for me. And I had taken a larger amount. So the, the, the larger the amount, the more, ex, more expensive it becomes because of the upfront costs that are attached to it. Anyway, that would be my take on it. At one point, our it sounded like, you no, know, depending on how much fun you have to use, I'm like, oh, I have infinite fun. This will be great. But uh, <laughs> I think you were saying funds. <laughs> um, so like I said, the last access we reviewed is sort of a home country bank or perhaps a U.S.-based bank. And in the end, you're more secure with a U.S.-based bank because the currency fluctuations will affect you. Um, that is on me. My bad. And so we've reached through the uh, our audience Q&A. And I have a question, which I see many people are asking in the chat. So I'm hoping we can, uh, our guys can help me out here. So our guys Many people here want to know, how do we decide who's eligible for an Empower loan or not? Or what are, you know, how do you, how can you qualify for an Empower loan? So can you review, <laughs> let's see, let's test you. Uh, can you review what's needed to qualify for an Empower loan? You are muted. <laughs> Just my luck. Just a habit. Anyway, uh, one that you need to be either a accepted or enrolled in one of the supported universities that we have, uh, which are close more than 400 in US and Canada, feel free to check out the list of schools on our website. But there are, you can be like assured that we cover most of the universities or almost all universities which house international students in the US and Canada, right? So that is something that you can be good at. Second, you need to be enrolled in a degree seeking program in any of those universities. And, and the major could be anything. We accept all majors, just that it needs to be a full-time degree-seeking program, right? And I think I covered all the three points. And at the time of school, you need to be in the U.S. It's a, or, like I said, it's supposed to be a full-time program. Or Canada, if you are. Or Canada, or Canada. Yeah, you need to be, exactly. Yeah, you need to be in the, <laughs> in the destination country. <laughs> Just to be super clear about a second question, we're getting a lot of, we support all nationalities. Uh, there are a few which the U.S. government says, no, we can't work with, uh, but it's a list of five and you likely know if you're a part of it. And then also we support all majors. So there aren't any restrictions in that in that way, just to be extra, extra clear there. Um, and so let's move on to our, our next question. Let's see. Arbaz, I'm going to go back to you real quick. Uh, sorry, a lot of these are Empower specific. Um, so if people want to earn money in school through the Empower referral program, how does that work? I Okay, so it's very easy. And all you need to do is get go to the website, generate a link, uh, put in your details, your friend's detail, and they're going to get a link to apply for an Empower Loan. All you need to do is make sure that they know what they, that you are referring them, making sure that they know that they, and you know that they need a loan. And at the same time, you know that you would appreciate the cash reward that you'll get. If you check all these three things, you can very easily ref, uh, refer any of your friends. I referred five people from my class, did not get any reward because I did not use the Empower uh, referral program. Sadly, so please do not make the same mistake. I could have earned so much money and, you know, maybe owned an Xbox or a PS4 by now, but I did not. So please feel free to go to that link that Saga has just shared in the in the chat and use, yeah, use that link to put in your details, your friends' details, and they're going to get a link to apply. That should be the easiest way to refer people and make sure that your friends also benefit from the Empower Loan. Everyone gets money. You get money. Your friend gets money. Money. Friend gets money. money. Yeah, money. Um, so I know we're in our last few minutes. So I have one audience question that is for both of you, and then I think we'll we'll wrap up. So audience, uh, that means if you haven't asked your question, now is super uh, the last minute or last moment to uh, send us a question. But several people here want to know about how to get a job after school, or as in you know while you're in school, what did you guys do to make sure that you were set up you know, career-wise, to then take that next step. And UD, I'm going to start with you. 
Yeah, um, I mean, it, I'm going to try to answer this uh, really quick, uh, but there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so to get a job in United States uh, or even an internship, uh, there's really two ways you can apply online or you can get through networking. I'm going to say this, that lot, like 70 plus percent of the jobs are filled through networking. So networking is the key uh, in United States. Uh, if you want to work for my company, my company is hiring. I, if I know you, I'm going to tell my boss that I know someone who uh, would be really good for our team. There's very high chances that person is going to not get hired, but at least will get a chance to interview. Um, then obviously it's on the person to you know uh, do the interview and based on their skills, et cetera. So focus on building relationship. Uh, again, see, I use the word relationship and not networking because a lot of time people just send a message. Can you refer me to this company? Don't start like that as a networking. Instead, start building relationship. Genuinely want to know the person and get help from them. Um, so that's that's one part of it. Second part of when it comes to online application, there's three things you need. One is your resume. One is second is your LinkedIn profile. And third is your portfolio. Uh, resume, again, um, I mean, I'm sure Empower has resources on how to build it, but maybe we can do another webinar on it. But focus on building good uh, resume. Uh, have a good LinkedIn profile before you land. What happens is people land here and then they start working on it. Have it ready before even you come. And then you can start improving your profile while you are get, taking your classes, et cetera. And then uh, building portfolio is very important. In United States, the hiring manager, I'm, I'm a hiring manager as well. We focus on what skills you have. I don't care what school you went to, but what can what skills do you have? What projects have you worked on? How can you help me in my team with the projects we have going on? It doesn't matter if you went to like a really fancy school. Can you actually solve the problem we have in our company? And the way we will judge you is if you have done projects similar to that, do you have a relevant experience? The way to have that relevant experience is to take the classes in your program is which gives you those project based experience where you can lead the project if you want to be a project manager where you can actually code and upload that i'm talking about tech because i'm in tech market but upload that program into github so people can see how you code etc so focus on building portfolio uh, which is uh, basically a list of projects which you have already worked on in your uh, in either in your high schools or school if your bachelors and uh, and the program which you will take in your master's well, I mean in your program in United States um but I know I like I took up three minutes uh, and oh, we no, have time, like, but... I, can't, uh, I can't gold star your answer enough so I'll take up a bit more time uh so <laughs> I'm from the U.S. I've gotten all of my jobs through networking it's something that is yeah. culturally known as something and it's normal for us but it, it might be abnormal for you. And something else he said was it's relationship building. Think of it as making friends or building, you know, real human connections and not sort of a transactional relationship. We can all feel that when someone's being transactional. That's not what it's about. It's more about people want to work with people that have similar values and a like-minded way of working. That's And that's mm -hmm. it. But Judy, that was a fantastic answer. And one more thing I will highlight is I'm also a hiring manager in marketing. I, I do not care what school you went to. I care about what you results you've achieved for literally anyone else that you can speak to and then do the same thing for me. So a lot of times people struggle with, you know, hey, I don't have a prestigious background. It's more about what you've accomplished and showing that versus uh, actually having anything that sort of... Uh, stands out as like a star brand name. Um, and Arbiz, I took him a more airspace. What do you have? <laughs> uh. I think you both covered most of the important points of this job search process. I think one thing that I might add to this entire answer would be, if you, if you, if you heard Yudi's answer, he did talk about what, like, how would you figure out your relevant experience? You would take up the classes that actually will give you those projects, right? And for that to do, you need to know where you want to go. So it's, it comes back to that working backwards and having clarity on where you want to go. And that is how you choose your class. That is how you choose your experience, tailored experience in an MBA program. And that is where you do small, small things that would get you to that job or that internship that you want. But it's important to know where you want and then start working your way up for it. That would be my final take on that job. 
Awesome. So we have reached the end of the webinar. I know we're a few minutes over, but we'll take a few more for those that are that are available. So last question, I always have two I end with uh, both of you, and I'll start with Arbaz since he's used to my my questions. But so Arbaz, what is your one piece of advice for everyone here that's planning their education journey? And then why would you recommend, what's the one reason you'd recommend Empower as a good lending option for them? Got it. Uh, one of the advice Advice, one of the one advice that I would give for all aspiring international students uh, is to do not lie to yourself. If you think there is a problem in your process, acknowledge it, work your way. Do not have that ostrich mentality that it's not affecting me right now. It doesn't mean that it won't affect you in the bad way in the future as well in your journey. If you think that you might not get the right job through a program like this, even though it might be easier to get in, accept it and then maybe look for an option that gets you closer to where you want to go. That would be, and I mean, a lot of students just get the options that they are getting instead of the ones that they want. And it's a two-way process. The school assesses you, you assess the school too, if you if they can help you, because you are putting a lot much effort and money into that school to get where you want. So why wouldn't you assess that school properly, right? And Empower I, is one, one companion that I would recommend across, like with for this journey, primarily because I've seen, I've worked here, I've seen the people, I've worked with people, and most of us are international students. And if those who are not, they are very well, uh, how would I say, concerned and connected with this journey a lot closely. And they really care about the experience for international students. And Empower as a company, because of that, individuals cares for its borrowers and actually goes out of the way to ensure uh, that the borrowers have a good experience. And I realized that during COVID when I was working for the company. So I've seen the times where Empower has, you know, had its back for this borrower, supported them, and a very trusted and responsible lender, something that I don't think I've ever seen any other lender do. Thank you, Arbai. So, Yudi, I uh, can bring us home with the same two questions. What is your one piece of advice for everyone here? And then why would you recommend Empower as a trusted lender? Yeah, um, obviously, Arbaz's advice is something you all you need to focus on that i'm going to go more philosophical in this way uh, don't give up uh, in your journey because i think a lot of people face hurdles and then they just give up um, i just want to share my story like i come from background where like i was a shy kid i was not able to do public speaking and my english was horrible like i uh, did not have great gre score entrance scores and all of that but i still made it and i'm i'm here uh, have a successful job etc so if i can do it i can only tell you like you are you're all much better than me and you can do it too so uh, so just you know believe in yourself uh, have that dream in you uh, define that dream write it down and then just keep going don't give up uh, and i say this in my video as well keep smiling keep hustling you got to hustle every single day but uh, empower i love the fact one it's a fixed interest rate um two i also love that you guys assign mentors or, or, or like the people who can help you uh, in the entire journey not like uh, the path to success or the career one because like arbaz has mentioned in the previous discussion that a lot of time people realize when they land that oh i have to do all these things which i didn't even know having someone who understands the entire student journey is so important. So uh, that's like, uh, it's a no brainer for me. So yeah, that's why I would recommend Empower to anybody. Thank you, Yudi. And uh, thank you both of you, or thanks to both of you for uh, joining me today for our introduction to Empower. For those attending, you'll get an email pretty soon with a recording of this webinar. Uh, so I, uh, we also will receive a survey, which is really important to us at Empower. Uh, we read every response. We use it to make these sessions better. And we also uh, look to see what other sessions you want to uh, attend. So if there's another topic you think is worth a dedicated live session, or if you have a question specifically for UD, Arbaz, or Empower team, uh, please get it back to us in that survey. We'd love to hear from you. And so... Uh, once again, thank you both Arbaz and Yudi. It was great having you here today. And uh, thank you for staying a few minutes extra and we'll see you next time.